Hi, my name is Mahendra Rao, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you have after we talk about making sure that you have access to CGMP IPSC. So when you consider making IPSC, there's a standard generation process. And what I'm using here is an outline based on reprocess CGMP IPSC process, but this could be applied to anyone's process. The first step as of course, all, as all, always is collecting donor. So there's a screening process for the donor and then there's a collection of whatever tissue sample you're going to use as starting material. The second step in the case of reprocell is fibroblast. In the case of other people, it might be blood or some other tissue sample. And you now use a process of reprogramming to make those tissue cells into IPSC. So that's the first step of reprogramming. The next step after that would be to make a seed stock of IPSC. And there'll be some important questions related to that seed stock as to where you make them and how you make them, but that's the basic step that you make a seed stock. Seed stock has to be stabilized and depending on your process, you might have, have some cleanup. And the next step will be to take that final IPSC line that you have identified and made and use and make a master cell bank. A master cell bank generally has to be made in a clean room and there are certain uh, standard processes that need to be followed to make a master cell bank. And then this master cell bank, as you know, is not final material. It's the starting material, input material for further manufacturing steps to make a differentiated product that you will use for cell therapy or for making any other biologic product from this IPSC. So those are the six basic steps in a generation process that I want to talk about. And today I'll focus on the first five steps uh, of this process. The key questions I'll try to address because these are the kind of questions that have come up time and again when I, we have talked with various folks about making CGMP IPSC lines. One big question always comes up is about donor issues. The second question is when do you enter a CGMP suite? How many CGMP runs do you need to do? Should I be using a clone or not using a clone? Engineering technologies and what kind of te technologies and what are those technology material, GMP or GLP? What is the QC required? And are there any specific geographical considerations? So I'll try to address them as I go through the talk. I will use the Reprocell method of making IPSC and their process uh, to try and address these issues. So for most of us, we look to the FDA for guidelines. And in Europe, you look to the EMEA. And in Japan, you look to the PDMA for the PMDA for the guidelines. And what you see listed on this slide uh, the different sort of guidances and rules that are there uh, as far as a donor uh, is concerned. And what's really important to note here are three things. One is that the rules that apply with the FDA may be different from the rules that apply with the EMEA and may be different from the rules that apply to the PMDA, which makes it's really important because if the starting material is not eligible for making a therapeutic product, then the subsequent IPSC line will not be eligible. So the first and most important criteria when you collect donor sample is to make sure that the donor sample collection is eligible in the geography that you want to work in. So that's really important. There are certain standard things that are common to all of them, uh, the different regulatory agencies, and that is you always have to screen the donor. You always have a standard questionnaire. There are some viral tests because of the possibility of transmission of human diseases that have to be done, and there are certain ethical guidelines. And then there is a process of collecting the tissue and tracking and tracing it as you move forward. Reprocell, when it does this, follows this FDA CGTP guidelines, but it's done an additional piece in being able to do that in that it has made sure by going to regulators to make sure that their collection process would be approved in most geographies. It's important to note that may be approved because there is no direct certificate that comes from any of these regulators to ensure that it will be approved. But nevertheless, they have taken that effort to be, make sure that that's possible. So that's the first step. And I'm just going to go through the next two or three slides to highlight what are the kind of common things that are required or the FDA has focused on. The first thing, of course, is there is the donor's blood it has to be sampled to make sure that they don't carry common uh, diseases. So HIV, 
uh, HBV, HCV, HTLV, Epstein virus, CMV, all of these have to be tested in the donor and the donor has to be negative for that. And they have to be negative at the time of tissue collection to make sure that it's compliant. And you sometimes have to retest because they might have got the infection and the test may not be positive. So some uh, regulatory regions require retest as well. So you need to make sure about that. And Reprocell makes sure about that when it does its collections. The next step, of course, is making sure that when you collect these, you have followed the appropriate ethical guidelines on human subjects, which means they have to be informed that there's going to be commercial use of the tissue sample that's been collected. There are standard rules that you have to follow, and these are pretty consistent across the world. When you take this met, you always have to ask a specific question, eh? and that the important thing in this analysis is, can the donor give consent? So the medical history, the risk questions, the travel information, the donor condition, all have to be really appropriately assessed, and there has to be a risk assessment interview. The travel information is particularly important because of the risk of uh, mad cow disease uh, for subjects who've traveled uh, to certain regions prior to two, 2010. And so that's really important to be able to keep that in mind because there's no test for TSE still. And as a result, if you can't finalize that from your donor consent, then it becomes really difficult to use that tissue for future iPSC generation. So, as I said, Reprocell follows all the ethical guidelines for all human subject research. They've worked with consultants to make sure that that's okay. And they've looked at all of this with a global perspective to make sure that this tissue samples collected by Reprocell could be used for any geography. The second step of after you've got the donor and you've made sure that you've screened the donor and the donor has given you approved consent, and you now decide to collect the tissue. So the second most important thing is how do you collect the tissue and where do you collect that tissue? In the case of Reprocell, of course, it's fibroblast, so it's a punch biopsy, so it's an outpatient procedure where you simply take a punch biopsy. You normally try and take it from a region which is not sun exposed to reduce the risk of uh, ha having environmental DNA damage so that your cells are as pristine as possible. Obviously, a younger donor is better than an older donor if you can get that. And when you're making a choice between male and female, a female donor is often considered better to, in terms of tissue mat matching, if that's possible. However, there's no specific hard and fast requirement, and there's no regulatory requirement on that basis. So here's the whole process that uh, has been put together. And again, I'm using the reprocell process, but the same basic ideas are important when you're moving this forward. And what you see below is what the cells look like after a punch biopsy is taken. And then when you take that tissue at passage zero and you expand it, you get a population of cells. The important point to note here right, when you're looking at that figure on passage three is that we have a large number of cells. When you take a small punch biopsy, these cells are in the log expansion phase and you can collect maybe between 15 to 20 vials which means you could make multiple iPSC lines from a single donor, and there would be different clones, and you could do it at multiple times. So if there were issues, you would have a safety net. This is really, really important to consider as part of the process because things can always go wrong. Your first run may not be correct, and you need to keep tissue as a reserve, as a requirement by the regulatory authorities in case you have to go back and redo things. And the important point I want to make here is when you're looking for any organization which is helping you collect tissue sample, these are the questions you will need to ask. And what I'm presenting today is that Reprocell has obviously considered this and has made preparations and provided an appropriate process to be able to do all of this. I won't walk you through the tissue process. It's there and you can always come back to this slide and look at it, but you can see how it makes sense. You, you have to have training, your facility has to be prepared, you need to do all the appropriate tests at the first visit, you need to take the punch biopsy, you need to start the expansion, and there's to be a follow-up visit just to confirm the donor tests that are required to be able to get that done. So now you've got tissue, you've got some of that tissue sample processed, you've got it stored. 
because the regulators require you to store sample, EMEA requires you to store it for 10 to 15 years, actually 30 years, and the FDA requires you to store it for 10 to 15 years. So you've got some samples stored. You also have some extra vials that you can use now to start the actual RNA reprogramming. And you may also have vials if you're using a novel or new process for reprogramming that you could do test runs for preparation. So what I haven't said is, so far is that you're ready, but where did you collect your fibroblasts? And I want to answer that question before I go to the RNA reprogramming. And the fibroblasts are not collected in a GMP suite. They're collected in a clean room under good tissue collection practices or GTCP practices. But the most critical piece is if you've got an appropriate donor is to track so that there is clear chain of custody between the donor and the fibroblasts and the storage where you stored them so that those follow appropriate rules and there's appropriate documentation. So I'll now go on to the RNA reprogramming. So Reprocell uses RNA-based reprogramming, and there are two issues when you consider reprogramming. One is freedom to operate, which I won't talk about because that's a licensing issue. Today, I'm only going to focus on the regulatory issues. And the other is how much does the process take? And as you know, the advantage of RNA-based reprogramming is that you don't get integration. And this just means that the kind of tests you have to do to look at uh, integration effects and off-target sort of effects or loss of function because integration is in a hyperactive region are all not necessary if you're doing RNA programming. On the other hand, if you're doing RNA programming using Sendai virus, then you may have to worry about persistence of the virus and other issues that are there. So the take-home message here is that when you do reprogramming, there are some specific tests that you'll have to do depending on the programming method that you use. Otherwise, the basic pro process otherwise remains the same. The big issue with reprogramming is where should you do it? Is it required that you do it in a CGMP suite or can you do it in a clean room or in a, in a lab and have appropriate documentation? So we've had this back and forth conversation with the regulators many times. And in general, the logic is that if it is not a repeatable process that's required every time you make a lot or a manufactured product, it doesn't have to be done in a GMP suite. Since you do IPSC generation one time for many generations of product, it is not necessary that you do it in a GMP suite as per definition of what is required for manufacturing. However, it's a new process. So different regulators have different interpretations on this. With the FDA, we are fairly com comfortable that they do not require making an IPSC line, the reprogramming process to be done in a GMP suite. They're happy if you do it, but they don't require it. It's not so clear from the EMEA or the PMDA. We have case-by-case -case reports that it's okay, but there are other folks who have told us that it's probably not okay. So that is one risk that you may want to keep in mind when you're selecting a program for helping you make your own GMP IPSC lines. Okay. I'm not going to walk you through this line. You probably have heard this many, many times. But the reason Reprocell prefers its programming uh, method compared to Sendai or episomal methods, et cetera, is listed here. And as you can see, it's quite quick and it's stable and many, many lines have been made and it's been quite reliable. And most importantly for me personally, there are kits available and the licensing process is pretty straightforward as well. So what that means for me is that all the documentation is available in one place and I can get that done relatively easily. With Sendai virus, the risk for that certain percentage of persistence is what makes it a little bit uh, more uncertain for me. I like episomal plasmids, they work. Uh, it's been quite consistent and I can use it with blood uh, quite easily. And the license requirements are not that uh, difficult uh, as far as I'm concerned. And so that's a good method as well. However, Integration can occur at a low frequency, and so the additional tests I have to do are more than what I would have to do with an RNA-based method. Okay. So one other piece that you have to consider here is 
You've got your tissue sample, you've got your process for making, and you've chosen one of these various processes, each one of them having some advantages or disadvantages. And now you have to decide which media and reagents you've used and are there any specific guidelines for this. And I, hear, I only want to say, here are the guidelines, you should read them yourself, but there is this operating assumption that at this stage, everything has to be animal origin free and there has to be no serum involved, et cetera. And the answer is, there is no such mandatory requirement by any of the regulators. In fact, there are several products that are made where the final product has been exposed to animal origin media or has been exposed to human uh, material or it's not fully defined uh, as you would require it to be in an ideal world. And the reason for that is, the reality is an important consideration. And that means that if nothing is available or there's no alternative way to do it, the FDA is not going to stop you from using what is shown to be safe. As long as you can document source requirements and safety requirements, you could use this material. It's always easier to uh, have source and safety requirements addressed when you have defined media and defined components because the tests are much easier but there is no requirement. Nevertheless, having said that, at least for growing the fibroblasts or growing blood cells, appropriate GMP grade or GMP qualified or cell therapy qualified reagents are available from a number of vendors. And as a result, you can really do this in whichever way at whatever level of comfort you need to. The next step, which is also important, is that now you've got your iPSC lines. At least you've made a reprogrammed cell and you've got multiple clones. And now you want to now make a seed stock of maybe 20 vials or maybe 40 vials. And there are two important questions about making that seed stock. And that is how many passages and what tests to decide that you've got this. And is it a clonal population or is it a polyclonal population? And there's some controversy in the field. So please understand I'm giving you my personal view and my experience with the regulators, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way or the best way to do that. Right. So before I come back to that, I just want to tell you the standard tests that people recommend for a seed stock. It's mycoplasma testing, sterility testing, tracking by STR or some equivalent of that, morphology, viability, karyotype analysis. There should be a certain purity analysis because you don't want any carryover of differentiated cells, et cetera, to be able to say that you have a homogeneous purified population. You want the cells to be pluripotent because that's the marker of utility. And you want to be able to have some kind of ability to say that they are really truly pluripotent cells, which means they can differentiate into the three germ layers. You'll note, I haven't put down here the necessity of doing teratoma formation. And the reality is teratoma formation is not a required release test that's required by any agency. It's a useful thing to know because it's another way to say that you've got potent or uh, truly uh, uh, iPSC-like cells. However, a teratoma assay is too variable and too unreliable to be used as a release test for any seed stock. Okay. Uh, I'll use this as an example before I go back to the point I was trying to make earlier. And that's, here's an example of a seed stock made from different donors by Reprocell. You can see this is the kind of testing that you need to do. You need to make sure that the karyotype is normal. A lot of people now really ask for array CGH or some additional you know, comparative genome hybridization technique for a higher resolution to having karyotype abnormalities not be present or minor abnormalities not be present. And at some scale, some clients require that we do whole genome sequencing and look at oncogenes and specific subsets of genes, which may be critical for what they need or don't need. But at a minimum, you need the HLA type as well. And so that's what Reprocell has collected. And here's an example of three donors from which they did this. So before I come to this, uh, this slide, I'm going to go back three slides to this slide that I told you about, about IPSC and clone selection. So our experience with when we make IPSC and we look at these cells, what we have found 
is that if you stress the cells at this stage and you do clonal analysis at an early stage where they're not yet fully stabilized as IPSC and they haven't developed the appropriate DNA repair mechanisms, the number of karyotypically abnormal cells you will get will be very high. And that's one reason what we recommend is that you collect multiple clones and do a pooled polyclonal population as an IPSC seed stock. Once you have a stable pooled polyclonal population, you can then subsequently make a clone later and you have very little risk that you will have added a karyotypic abnormality at this stage. In fact, I personally may have made more than 25 lines using this pooled polyclonal technology for our cells, and we have never yet lost a line because we had karyotypic abnormalities. And the cost saving that we've had by doing it this way has been significant because I don't have to screen 20 to 30 clones and have them grow, and it takes me a much shorter time period to do it. Reprocell follows this process, and that's why I wanted to emphasize it. Okay. So as I tried to point out all through this, I was using the Reprocell uh, process to highlight all of these questions and emphasize why rep that Reprocell has considered them. What I wanted to remind people here was how you can access this. Reprocell doesn't require you to go and get the entire process from them. You can get whatever you need at any step that you need. So you can either get donor cell tissue from them for a price, you can get reprogramming done and a seed bank done, you can get clone isolation if that's what you prefer, you just want the QC testing done, or if you want early pilot clones for research use and then come back later for an MCB, then you can access that. And I would recommend you talking to Reprocell colleagues to see which way will work best for you. Okay. The last piece I want to talk about today is the master cell bank uh, that needs to be made. So keep in mind what we've just said so far. You've got your fibroblasts, you've got some fibroblasts stored at a particular stage. You have all the consent and documentation and tracing procedures in hand. You've got the RNA reprogramming done. You know that you've got freedom to operate and you have a polyclonal pool and you've made a decision. I'm either going to take the polyclonal pool or I'm going to take a single clone. And from that single clone, I'm going to make a master cell bank. So now you decide you want to make a master cell bank. This, I think, it is reasonable to assume that you should be making it in a GMP suite because this is going to be a start, standard starting material for multiple replete processes. So the entry into a GMP suite should be definitely by this stage. So this is the standard steps that one thinks about when one is making a master cell bank. As I pointed out that we made the seed stock, we're making it outside a GMP suite. It's all the input material that's being used. You're generating the IPSC. You're making your clonal seed bank if you need to have it clonal, and you're taking those wires to make MCB. So you've done the QC and you've made that seed stock. You now go in to the GMP suite, and generally people always say, you should do three runs, run one, run two, run three, you know, the pilot runs, you can do engineering runs, and then you can do your GMP run. And for all of them, you have training, facility preparation, you have batch records to be able to do that. And then you thaw your while from the small step, expand on plates, you have a, your seed train, maybe you have to grow it large enough that you're doing it in suspension culture, you harvest, you fill and finish. On average, most people want to make an MCB of between 100 to 400 vials, and that works well with the size of manufacture, the size of suites, and the number of uh, folk required to do this in one run in a reliable way to do fill and finish at the final end of making a GMP bank. So the critical points are in red. You need to have your release assays and uh, for information only assays that you decide are important for future use. You need to make sure that you have deviation and issue reporting. And you need to know that your facility and your people have all been trained appropriately and you have all the certification and suite requirements tracked. And you need to have tracking through this whole process. So once you have these, you have what would be considered GMP qualified material. There's one thing I have not mentioned here and I'll come back to that when we do that. And then this material is just your starting material to make your final product. So this is pretty straightforward. Any CDMO which does manufacturing knows how to do this. 
and there's very good FDA guidance for all of these steps and processes that you're going to do. I'm going to add one more step here before I address some specific issues. Now, if you've got your IPSC CGMP bank and you now want to add engineering to it, how do you normally do it? Would you do all the engineering in a GMP suite or would you now do it outside? Normally, most engineering requires you have to pick clones. Picking clones and taking a GMP suite for that time period of growing and testing where you have to do that is very difficult and very expensive. So most people with regulatory approval do engineering outside the GMP suite and then bring it back into the GMP suite by doing the engineering outside. So that's the flow chart that you see here. And of course, once you bring it back in, you do all the same steps of doing runs to be able to get that done. Okay. So before I come here, there was one more question that I wanted to emphasize to everybody. So the question here is, do I always need to do three runs? And the answer here is, I'm gonna use the FDA's a definite maybe. You know, it's a case by case condition. If you are working with a CDMO, which has multiple experience, you know, processes that it has run to make IPSC lines and your process is identical to that, then you probably don't need three runs. A single run would be sufficient because this is still input material that needs to be manufactured. If however, you're going with a new CDMO or your process is radically different because you want to do it in a new fancy way, or your engineering requires you to grow the cells in a completely different uh, process, then you would need to do three runs at a minimum. On the other hand, if it is a CDMO like Reprocell, or it is a CDMO like Pluristics, who I work for, or it's one of the bigger CDMOs like Lonza, then it would be quite possible that you could get by with having to do a single run using their documentation and their processes and their experience to validate this process. The next step is QC release and characterization assays. So you don't have a GMP material till you've done the quality control release and you have the appropriate characterization assays. So, so quality control, of course, is throughout the process. There's some kind of quality testing you're doing at the tissue level. There's some kind of quality control at the establishment of fibroblasts for RNA programming, for IPSC seed stock generation, for expansion, for making the master cell. So those are the in vitro uh, or in process testing that you'll have to do. And I've listed some of them here and we talked about some of them earlier as well. So these are what I would consider release assays. And what is important about release assays are two things. One is of course the list of the assays, but the important thing is it has to be done by qualified vendors. And the important thing to remember about qualified vendors is vendors may be accepted as qualified vendors in one geography and may not be re recognized as qualified vendors in another geography. A test to detect mycoplasma, for example, may be recognized as an acceptable QC test or may not be recognized as an acceptable validated QC test. So those are the questions you always have to ask with whoever you're doing those tests. Mycoplasma, for example, is a good example for using that. Uh, it's PCR-based testing and mycoplasma light and several other methods have uh, been pioneered and are cheap and reliable and work. And I use them routinely all the time, but they are not recognized as a validated assay by the FDA. So you can still use them, but then you have to show the validation results and generate that validation yourself. So that's an important thing to remember. Either you use a validated test, and if you're using a non-validated test, you have to validate it yourself and provide that data to convince the FDA that this is equivalent to a validated test. And that's very important to keep in mind when you're looking at vendors. So look at the test that's required, look at the guidances to make sure that you know that this is the test that you're going to do is an appropriate test and make sure that you're using a validated vendor to do that. Uh, sterility testing is standard. There's a list of uh, standard sterility requirements that one has to do for any product that is being used. And so one does that. There's viability, which is a standard from experience that people have had on using these cells. 
this tracking and traceability and the de facto standard has been str genotyping though you could use anything else if you wanted the karyotype analysis it's normal diploid karyotype again i want to emphasize it's not that you cannot use abnormal karyotype cells people have used them all the time and cell lines have been used in therapy and have been used to treat humans though fda is more worried about stability of karyotype it's always easier if you have a normal karyotype but stability of karyotype is the critical piece because then you know that what you'll get at the end will be the same if the karyotype is varying then you're going to have a huge problem so that's what is important to remember it's not normal karyotype but stable karyotype which is important when you're considering all of these things purity analysis and characterization this is what we did as acceptance criteria or release criteria uh, to be able to use the cells that we made in the master cell bank there's also endotoxin testing there's standard human virus testing uh, there's advantageous agent testing and there's if you're exposed to xeno material there's bovine porcine virus testing that has to be done and this you have to remember is not just whether you used uh, uh, for xeno material in your process it's also your primary and secondary supplier especially when you're doing commercial manufacturing so it's really really important to go through those that documentation not just for your own media and reagents but also the secondary suppliers as to how they manufacture uh, their process as well so collecting that kind of documentation takes quite a lot of time so this is uh, standard trilineage differentiation there's genetic fidelity there's characterization for the characterization by immunocytochemistry or molecular characterization by pluritest or scorecard i'm going to uh, emphasize a little bit here on this pluritest or scorecard so you know what people have noticed is that you know you can use oct4 and you can use uh, tras staining and you can use sox2 and all of these look at a percentage of cells that are there but it's not a really good predictor and you you can't really keep doing and trilineage differentiation also doesn't tell you about the specific subtype that you have so what we have found is that the spluri test which is basically a uh, you know unbiased score of looking at the number of pluri pluripotent markers compared to what's expressed by other well known and well characterized ipsc lines gives you a good predictor of the overall potency of your cells and to our mind if something passes pluri test it generally has worked in all the lineages that we've had to look at so while it's not a required test we actually encourage everybody to use some equivalent of this pluri test or pluri potent stem cell scorecard or some equivalent to be able to do that we find that the snp arrays snp arrays which you can use to follow cells on a very uh, quick and relatively cheap way is a good way to do follow up after you have done whole genome sequencing or you've got a ray cgh and you've got all the sort of basic uh, tests done one time uh, snp arrays can allow you to pick up things and changes that have occurred from the previous time by just doing a comparison between test done one year before and a test done one year later and the total cost is quite low so it's not required but it's a very useful way to maintain quality control now additional tests that are required for engineering you know you need to do off target effects insertion site analysis silencing of genes stability of the line and is if there is a selection marker is the selection marker removed or or that's foreign dna and does it cause a foreign dna response so last piece is cell therapy manufacturing and i'll try and conclude and take questions uh, in another 5 minutes or so. so so these are the questions that different groups have asked us when we have provided them information or provided them with a line right we expect to use existing samples that are already used for manufacture for clinical product can we proceed by reference to information from the provider of the material what does that mean so imagine now i talk to you about using fibroblasts that i took as a punch biopsy from a donor so somebody came and asked us and said look we are using this msc product that we already manufactured now it's being used to treat patients or oh, look 
I'm using this CD34 material that I was doing for bone marrow transplant, or this was cord blood that I collected for therapy. It's approved. Why can't I just take this material? It's already a clinical grade material, so I can put it into humans and just use that as my starting material to make iPSC. And the answer is yes, you can, as long as you have access to that documentation and that process so that you can use that by reference. So the answer to that first question is important. And the reason I'm emphasizing it is that that can reduce your time period of making an iPSC line, right? Imagine if I could go to my colleagues in the MSC field, I could go to my colleagues in the NK field or go to my colleagues in the gamma delta T cell field and then get some, some cells which are already approved for clinical use and have been manufactured appropriately and have all the documentation and I can make an iPSC line. The next question we've been asked quite often is we expect to perform the engineering and clone selection in a CGTP environment with appropriate tracking and tracing and documentation. Is this sufficient? And as I tried to point out earlier in the talk, I did think that this was sufficient. But remember, regulations change with time. And so what I would recommend is to assemble your process, which is in CGTP, and go for an interact meeting with the FDA with as much data as you have at that time and ask this question specifically for your process. It's really important to do that because you may have missed something that would otherwise be okay for somebody which you have not performed or your tracking and tracing is different or your vendors are such that it's impossible to get approval because they don't have that appropriate documentation that you might need to use this CGTP process. So ad additional documentation for engineering. We propose to use Sleeping Beauty transposon system and CRISPR-Cas9 editing, and we will assess integration sites and off-target effects using standard established protocols. Is this sufficient? Now, this is a really important piece, and the reason I added this question because we've gotten this several times. And the reason it's important is that there's no specific guidance available from the FDA or from any of the other regulatory agencies on what can be done and what will be okay or what will not be okay. So since it's not there, it's really a case-by-case -case basis for this. And we are still learning what's important or not. And this will tell you why the FDA has been worried and so many of the clinical trials that have been held recently have had holds. The holds are not because something bad has happened, it's because something unexpected has happened. And when something unexpected happens, the FDA always worries, is it because we were lax or that this is something that we have to learn so that we have to add an additional test that we require everybody to do. So those are very important things to keep in mind, which means that we think standard established protocols may be sufficient, but we need to go to the regulators and ask them. Since the MCB is input material in a bioproduction process, can we maintain a drug master file for an MCB as opposed to a final product, as is done for viral producer lines and biological production lines? This is another really important piece that I, as an advisor for a long period of time, uh, have been advocating. And if you know the cell line that was made by the NIH uh, carries a drug master file, even though the line itself has not been used in a therapeutic product that's uh, uh, approved. And the reason for that was that the FDA agreed that this logic was okay. but they did not say that this is what we will do routinely. They said we will do it as a case-by-case -case basis. And last year, in their guidances, they reported that we do not recommend that an IPSC line, MCB manufacturer, carry a drug master file designation, unlike the DMF we give routinely for CHO cell or HEX cell, which are used in the same way for manufacturing and our input material. So we don't know what has changed, but the FDA, it's always worth asking because having a drug master file for the CDMO, which is making lines, makes them really, really comfortable, right, with clients. Is a PERT assay along with whole genome sequencing sufficient for inapparent viral testing as compared to vero cell co-culture assays or electron microscopy at this stage? So maybe I'll explain this for some of the uninitiated and I apologize for those who know this, but one really important requirement for sterility in addition to that is what's called inapparent virus testing. So what does inapparent virus testing mean? It means that you could have a virus, but we don't see any 
functional tests that will allow us to detect it. And since we don't know which virus is there, we don't know how to test for it. So the way we normally test for this is to use a line, which is called the Vero cell line. And we do a co-culture with the conditioned media from the cells or the lysate from the cells, depending on what you're looking at, or with both. And it's a long-term culture where we say that, well, if I don't have even low, un relatively undetectable by other methods, particles of virus present, because the Vero cells are so sensitive, I will be able to see this if I do the experiment with concentration, et cetera, right? And I can come up with a sensitivity to do that. The problem with this is it's not a definitive test and it takes very long and it's quite expensive. So people have said, well, why can't I just look at viruses inapparent viruses by using something else that's common, right? You know, just like for human cells, we can always use mitochondrial DNA to look for contamination, right? So for retroviruses, we can use uh, uh, reverse transcriptase assay for detection of the reverse transcriptase enzyme. Uh, and that could be an important way to be able to uh, identify whether we have even trace amounts. And it's, it's a very sensitive test. So if that's negative, maybe we don't need to do the Vero cell co-culture assay. Can I look at whole genome sequencing? Remember when you do whole genome sequencing, you're sequencing everything and you're sequencing it really at high resolution. So why can't we just use whole genome sequencing and look at all what's the so-called junk DNA, which is the unmapped DNA, and ask whether there's just viral particles that I can detect because they map to a virus. And people have shown that this can be done. There's a company called PathoQuest which sells something, uh, a test along those lines, and there are several companies that do a quad assay. Unfortunately, so far, the FDA has not agreed. So this means that we have to consider that we may at some stage have to do this inapparent viral testing, which costs well over 100,000 to do. And only a few companies do this on a routine basis and are validated suppliers of this test. My personal opinion is it's a risk, but you can take your MCB and not do this till you're ready to go with the final product manufacturer and then do it. But the risk is if by some remote chance or bad luck, you have got something that comes out positive, everything will be on hold and you'll have to go back and do all of this again. So it's a plus minus decision that's critical for you guys to make. Okay. Making a sub-bank from this MCB about 10 passages downstream in a CGMP suite is an important business strategy. We propose the following test for such a sub-bank. And this is a question that I think is very important. So imagine now you've made a bank of 100 uh, vials of your master cell bank, and you now just take a while, and now you expand that to make another 100 vials. This is a way I could supply to another sub, as a CDMO to another company, and that would be their bank for making product. And what other tests I need to do for this sub bank? I mean, it's just a product that's come out of this bank. It's in the GMP suite. I've never moved it out. I've done certain tests on the master cell bank. What do I need to do again on a sub bank? The regulators have been silent on this topic. We, nobody has gone to them specifically with this question, but this is an important thing for everybody to consider because you can imagine the cost savings if we could do this. Next question everybody's asked because you know we've offered to sell uh, MCB uh, to more than one supplier and the question has always come up that, well, if these guys use this MCB and they have an adverse event that can be attributed to the cells that were made from this, what will it do? Will it, there be a hold on my self as well, because I'm using cells from that same master cell bank. And we've gone to the FDAs and we very clearly asked this question. And the answer is, if you make two working banks, which are separate working banks, then one does not have to be affected by the other, because now they are separate. And that's a really important distinction. But if there's any concern, you need to make sure you check with the regulators yourself, depending on your process. And this is an important question that you need to consider. Since different engineering may be required using the same technology or the same sites, we plan to qualify new MZ, MCB by release criteria identi identical to what we will use for this line. Is this sufficient? Again, this may sound a little bit complicated, but let me try and explain. Let's say 
everybody today is now talking about doing class one, class two now. And I just take my same uh, CRISPR-Cas9 construct exactly the same. And I always do my class one, class two knockouts for new cell lines with that same CRISPR and the same Cas9, you know, and the same procedure and the same electroporator. What do I need to do which is new for this line? And if I do it again, what do I need to do? And it's not clear. We can't use this and say I have to do all the tests again, right? And oh, the quality control or release is different. I mean, it's, I know what the, what the off-target effect should be. I know what has to be done. I can maybe do a more limited set of tests. And that's a really important question that is important to confirm with the regulators or with whoever are your advisors for this regulatory process. The last question is a really important one, and we put this to the FTA and we've asked other people this, but we've not gotten a specific answer. You know, tracking and traceability is good, and everybody has said STR is a good way to be able to do this. But STR will not distinguish one clone from another clone and will not distinguish between an engineered subclone of a clone. And if that's the case, how do we distinguish between the two? What is the additional test which will be required for tracking and traceability? And this is not a trivial question. I want to remind you that if you remember, Syrah had a problem that they had a GFP subclone which contaminated the parent line. And as a result, they lost that match uh, of cells that they had made. Um, they did everything right, but you know, there was no way to track it till they found a glowing cell. So we need to really worry about this and work with the regulators so that everybody is satisfied or everything will be on hold till we figure out a way to distinguish these things. There are ways, but they're all expensive and we need to get consensus on what everybody will agree is a good way to do this. Yeah. I'm going to end by saying that this is not something that only Reprocell is doing. There are many people trying to do all of this and therefore there has become a consortium of folk who are looking at how the industry itself can help jointly solve some of these problems. And you can look at, there are partnerships for offering a whole uh, workflow that have developed. California Institute of Regenerative Medicine is somebody that Reprocell is working with because some thinks that Reprocell can really help them get that done. BioBridges, GenCure, et cetera, have a partnership where they will just make the master cell bank so that uh, we don't have to uh, make everything at Reprocell. Histocell is another company which has been doing something like that. There are several companies that have offered to do clinical gene editing. For example, uh, Pluristics works with Reprocell to coordinate to be able to do clinical gene editing in cell lines that Reprocell has generated or which we have licensed from them to be able to do that. And there are several other companies as well. Okay. So, the, so this is just a summary slide. It shows you what the timeline is to be able to get all of these things done. This is the process by which things get done. And you can see each step as listed below is what the timeline is for being able to get that done. The last two slides, are, we've worked with uh, Reprocell and Reprocell itself has done it, is to make uh, knockout lines for class one and class two uh, using GMP grade processes to be able to make a universal IPSC line. And they have lines available for generation. I'll end here with saying that Reprocell clinical license IPSC are made with the STEM RNA fourth generation technology, which is proprietary to Reprocell. They have a simple licensing agreement. And I can't tell you how important this was for us when we uh, started doing our work uh, as well. And it's something that we followed at Pluristics as well, was we recommend a one-time royalty payment with no milestone-based payments or revenue-based royalties and no restrictions by therapeutic area. You get a line, you made a payment, you know that you can use it and you can move forward and create your world beating product. The last slide here is CDMOs and the issues. And I, I want to emphasize this because of my own personal experience here. Everybody's busy. Many CDMOs say they have experience, they don't have it. Only a few have lines on hand, so everything takes time. Only some have their own technology. Otherwise, you have to get technology from uh, in license that technology before they can do it. Very, very few of them have their own in-house testing. Uh, 
uh, only some can make a differentiated product. There are licensing requirements such are quite complicated and auditing is difficult because the number of well-qualified auditors is limited. The reason why I've highlighted Reprocell here or why we had this conversation is it looks to me that Reprocell is one of the few which has done all of this to make sure everything can be in-house and they can do this. Thank you.